What's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino. It's episode number 69, man. 60 bloody nine. And if you guys know me or you know anything of me, you'd know what that special number means to me, baby girl. And you know what it is also? It's episode 69. It happens to also be the day that I was born. It's a commemoration of the day that I was born. You know, that happens like every certain day around each year there's a certain day where you celebrate the day you were born aka a birthday it happens to be my birthday and it's episode number 69 you know i'm gonna go sizzler tonight huh you know the brunette's gonna get some work in hey you know we're gonna go <laughs> we're gonna go up and down head and toe you know leaky leaky stations big up all my 69 fans out there actually that being said um talking about 69 the can't remember the last time i actually done a 69 actually it's, it's, it's the kind of thing, 69s are in the same company as like um, sex on the beach, sex in the shower, um, sex on the toilet seat and shit. You know, like things that uh, were really appealing to you when you were young and you didn't have that many sexual experiences. But then the, the older you get or the more sex experiences that you do have, the more you start thinking, you know what, these things are kind of overrated, you know? Like, uh, do you remember when you used to get really bad head, if you're a guy, right? When, when, a, when a girl was really bad at doing any sort of blowjobs or whatever, and they say we just all teeth, you'd be, you know, you'd, you'd like grin and bear it. You'd be like, oh, so much pain. But it was probably the only time if you've had it, you've, you've that's happened to you in the last, I don't know, 25 years or some shit. So you're not going to complain about it, are you? But in the one time someone does it properly, right? Someone with skill, a bit of panache, you know, a little bit of extra tricks and flicks, whatever you're into, you're like, woohoo, you can never go back again. So I guess... I'm tr- what I'm trying to say in the end is that birthdays are like blowjobs, right? Um, you kind of don't want them, but then when you do get them, you're happy you had them, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, welcome to episode number 69. I'm your host, I guess, in Zinger. And if you're watching this on the YouTube stream or on YouTube recording, please click that link. Please click that like button right under below or under below, right below this <laughs> video. Uh, maybe not, right? Maybe don't click uh, like if, if I don't have a good command of the English language, but you know, give, give me some time here. Give me some time. I'm, I'm, I'm holding eye contact. I'm making sure I'm looking at the camera. I'm not looking at my bloody monitor over here. But yeah, so um, give me a like underneath the video. Subscribe, share with friends, leave me a comment. What you did like, what you didn't like. Am I rambling too much? Blah, blah, blah. You know, those little points and tips and tricks are always beneficial, especially in the beginning when you're trying to get your foot um, on the old ladder. I've been a bit slow with my uploads. I'm still uploading them once a week. I'm trying to do two or three times a week as well. But the issue I have here is that sometimes the video doesn't work as well as I want it to work. But I think I've kind of got it figured out. Um, when I was recording earlier, I, I've, I've been testing it for the last hour and a half, basically. You probably don't really care, but hey, let me just tell you anyway. I've been trying to test the video stuff for the last hour and a half, and it kept lagging. And then I realized that maybe I, I had the bit rate up too high, or maybe the resolution was too high, blah, blah, blah. In the end, I figured it out that I can't record this in 1080p because my computer can't handle 1080p. So this is going to be 480p, super basic uh, video. But I realized, or I know from experience of having watched um people like casey nice and other um youtubers they always say the key to like winning on youtube is to have really good audio so even though the video might be a bit shitty it's not that clear um the, i haven't got that good lighting i've just made sure that i'm recording this in the afternoon so i have the benefit of natural lighting and obviously you can see these two massive big beams of light coming through these amazing windows so that kind of helps things out a little bit but as long as i've got the audio um really really you know including the map team with this lovely microphone i've got this nice little foam shield that i bought on amazon big up amazon big up all my prime customers out there there's what 100 million of us right i saw that on the news the other day like they have 100 million paid paying prime sub- sub- fucking subscribers amazon is killing it so imagine all the people that don't mind doing it for free right i was one of the people right i was like no nah, i'm not gonna pay prime i'm just gonna I'm just going to, my items get to me when they get to me. But once you have Prime, you can never go back, man. It's, what, eight quid? Plus, you get the benefit of Amazon videos. Oh, they've got some amazing series on there. I watched this really good Italian cop drama on Amazon video, too. That was really good, actually. Um, A lot better than I thought it would be. Of course, a lot of the, the programs on Amazon aren't original Amazon productions. But most of my stuff, they've kind of bought or they've licensed. But, you know, Amazon's fucking killing. 100 million. Is it 100 million or 100? It must be 100 million. 100 million paid Amazon Prime subscribers. Jesus Christ, but it does go to that. It's that adage, right? Isn't it? There's a there's a famous adage where it goes, you are in order to amass in order to amass like wealth, you have to be of service to the most amount of people, right? So if 
Amazon is a, is F, Amazon is the one common denominator that links all people within the Western Hemisphere, right? In terms of you know people that can afford it and stuff, then it would make sense that the person that owns it would be one of the richest people in the world. And Jeff Bezos is probably one of the richest people in the world, anyway, isn't he? Especially if you think about self-made, like if, if especially if you if you minus out all the all the people in the royal families and the Middle Eastern princes and all that sort of shit, right? And people that have um, um, inheritances because their family names are big or whatever it may be. And you just look at people that have amassed wealth within their own lifetime. Jeff Bezos have to be up there. He has to be fucking up there. I, I, I always love seeing that picture as well of him working in a... Well, I, I don't know if it's maybe the first Amazon offices where he's got the massive vinyl um, banner on the, on, on, on the wall. It just says like Amazon.com or something. Super interesting to see how far they've got as a business. But yeah, big up all my Amazon Prime customers out there. You know how it is. Next day delivery gang. Anyways, man, it's, it, I'm happy to be back, man. Happy to be back. Um, it's been a fucking chock a weekend for me, actually. I, I just DJed on Saturday, or just, I DJed just the, the Saturday just gone at my night called La Betise it, the, at the Heath Cotton Star. Let me get up the fly here so you guys can see it. Hopefully it's on the screen. Yeah, DJ there at Heath Cotton Star. What an amazing, amazing, amazing night it was. I'm not going to lie. I had loads and loads and loads and loads of fun. It's up there here. As you can guys can see it. Can you guys see it here? It's on the big screen there. La Betis. Yeah, I had a I had a lot of fun. Um it's been it's been really, really good lately to be honest. I'm getting a lot more sets than I used than I were before. I looked on my because I always put the um, event up on the Resident Advisor. I put I mark it on Facebook. I tweet it all the time. I put it up on Instagram. Just a standard thing, you know, to make sure people are seeing what I'm doing and stuff. But I always put up on on RA. And RA gives you like a, a, a look, you know, you can look at all the events that you put up. And it's been good because I've been, I've been basically DJing there every, every month. Sometimes twice a month, which is such a blessing. Do you know what I mean? Especially from coming from a place where it was super erratic when I was playing at the birds. It was like a bit... You know, it was just here and there whenever they had a cancelling. Of course, the Heathcote style primarily started off as me filling in for people that weren't going to be there, right? And people that were cancellations and stuff, which was I'm happy to do. But if I'm being relied on consistently to put on a great party, then why not? Do you know what I mean? I think that's, that, that is a good um, pat on the back for myself, actually. So that was a great night. The only problem I had with it was prior. I didn't really prepare as well as I thought I should, as probably I should have. Um, I tried to, I did arrange a playlist throughout the week, but I didn't um, export it until the day before or the night of, um, if I'm completely honest. And usually, I, I remember, I think I had a false sense of how long it actually takes because I remember the last couple of times I did it, I must have, I, 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 um, I incorrectly thought that it was quicker than what it should be. But I think what happened last time that I did it quickly was that I didn't change that many songs around, right? I maybe added, I don't know, let's say I added 20 songs into a playlist that's already there. So the, ch the, the the chunk of it was already on my memory card. So by the time I exported it, it didn't have that much more to export. But I had, I, I completely changed the order of the songs I was going to play. I had these loads of like kind of weird like Afro jazz stuff I wanted to play in the beginning, um, moving into a bit of like a bossa nova and then going into a bit of like, pop, um, a bit of like Itello disco, some like, pop stuff whatever and then going into like some disco and then some house and then closing up the set with some you know pop ballads whatever it may be but when i then went to export it the little um time remaining figure at the bottom of record box was like oh you got five hours 15 minutes left i was like shit and it was like 8 20 right and my set starts at nine o'clock luckily uh i got an uber which um is like 20 minute 50 15 minute no 10 15 minute drive away so i was like you know what i'm gonna try and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and push it as close to deadlines I can as possible. But towards the end, I just couldn't do it. And the time kind of ran out. So I just kind of had to play the stuff that I had already on my memory card. And the other error I made, again, I didn't take all my memory cards with me. I should have took them all with me. But I only took one. That's the main one that I usually play with. It's, like, um, it's got most of the places on there. But it doesn't have everything, you know. And it's just like, ugh. anyway, in the end, it didn't really work out the way I wanted to in terms of the tunes. It was okay. It wasn't as good as I could have played. I could have played a lot more better. And I should, I should have played a lot more better. But, you know. Um, you learn with these kind of things and I guess the lesson there is just to always be prepared you know just do these things ahead of time there's no there was no real reason for me to like do that so late yes I'm working yes I don't have yes I'm quote unquote don't have time but there's plenty of time for between the times I finish work and times I start for me to uh, I've got it done especially since I, I always start work quite late I start at like 12 and end at eight, half eight so I've got loads of time between the time that I wake up go to work out come back home and have breakfast to kind of export that stuff and yeah just again just another lesson that kind of heads up Jeremy whenever you 
it's sometimes you give yourself a false you get you you think you can do it a lot quicker than it actually can be done right you can you should always add an extra extra time onto the task that you think is going to take five minutes it's usually going to take half an hour an hour so that's a lesson to be learned for next time but yeah what a great night man i, I really enjoyed it and i'm actually DJing again um this friday um i'm actually recording this on a wednesday the 25th of april happens to be my birthday so why not pop a beer actually i've got a little beer from Lidl. big up Lidl. what's it called uh perlin backer one of the best beers out there 89 pence look at that nice and frosty right nice and bloody frosty we're gonna practice open um in celebration of my own birthday i think it's the best i'd like to do i'm not really a big fan of birthdays i fucking hate all that me me celebration shit but you know it's a podcast um it's a i'm, I'm streaming on youtube i'm also gonna put this up on itunes so if you listen to this on the audio i cracked open a beer and yeah salute <sighs> lovely so yeah um I'm playing again on Friday, actually, coming up at the um, at the White Post Cafe in Hackney Wick. So if you're in the area or you know of that place, then please come down. I'd love to see you. That would be amazing. So that would be fun as well. And I've got the weekend off, which is fucking banging. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do, actually. There's a, there is a live orchestra thing happening at the XO Wire. Um, and they're doing a rendition of the, I don't know, the best, best of Daft Punk, right? Which sounds fucking amazing. So I might, we, I might do that as a as a way to celebrate the old B day. Invite the old brunette out, and we will go together, get fucked up, and then come back home. Or I might just like chalk it off as another day because I can't remember the last time I actually celebrated my birthday properly. I think I, I saw some pictures on Facebook. You know, this is um your memories from a few years ago. And I remember when I used to go work at Dr. Martin's. We had like a thing which I didn't, you know, I didn't want to do it, but the manager took us out for a birthday meal and bought us drinks and shit because a couple of other people in the shop also had their birthdays we kind of did it all together and i think that's the last time i actually had a group of people with me to celebrate quote unquote a birthday i don't know i just think it's a bit self-indulgent in my own humble opinion but i guess if i was talking to a therapist and i was being completely honest i'd say maybe it's kind of a de weird defense mechanism you know i don't want to i don't want to celebrate it because celebrating it means acknowledging i'm getting older and getting older that kind of celebration of that I'm getting older means I have to then reach out to people in order to celebrate it with. And if someone says no, my ego will get dented and I feel like a loser. I think I think maybe that's maybe the if you used to get really, 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 really macro on it, right? Then that might be one of that might be a, the underlying issue. But I don't think it is personally because I don't necessarily give a shit what anyone thinks about anything. I don't necessarily go out of my way to hang out with anyone either. Um I don't purposely keep friends around me, so that wouldn't be a thing. But I don't know, there might be something in there about the disappointment thing, you know, of like, because once you say you're going to celebrate your birthday, you got to invite some people out with you, right? And no one wants to be posting a picture online of celebrating your birthday. There's only one person, right? No one, no one does that, I don't think. I've not seen anyone celebrate their birthday. Just say, it's just me, you know, just hanging out. Um, just me. Um, but I, I did remember ages ago seeing someone, I don't know, it just, maybe about that kind of scar. I remember ages ago, because now I don't have my feed open, right? So I have my feed kind of closed, so I don't really, um, I'm not, how you say this uh yeah i don't know i don't i can't see my feed right because i don't i don't necessarily care what everyone else is like, getting up to in that regard which is bad hey but hey what can you do but i remember when i did have my feed open i remember seeing this guy on my um facebook page with a champagne bottle saying oh like happy birthday to me like a glass of champagne and i i, I don't know it just it just made me really feel really really sad you know first of all i don't celebrate birthdays anyway but if this guy is celebrating his birthday why is he drinking a bottle of prosecco on his own do you know what I mean at home it's like oh bless do you know what I mean and plus sharing the world I, I think sh having a having a glass of bubble on your own in your house like a fucking grown man is great I think that's amazing you know what I mean it's super liberating like more power to you dude but putting out up on Instagram or Facebook and shit it's just a little bit I don't know it seems like a bit of a cry for help do you know what I mean like, someone come and save me please someone be my friend um I'm not I don't want to be a friend sorry but to be honest but I guess someone else will be your friend you know someone else out there but I don't know it's just a bit sad I think in general um i think there's also needs to be a time limit on birthdays too you know i don't know man like if, if you're over the age of i don't know 25 should you even be celebrating your birthday go out have some fun but should it be a big deal where everyone has to drop what they're doing and because i always whenever think about yourself right anyone that you know who's a who's like a serial birthday celebrator especially the ones that have like their birthday week a birthday weekend whatever they're kind of annoying you know they kind of expect you to drop everything you're doing and and kind of bow at their altar of ah oh, because they managed to turn another year older it's like dude like get over yourself man you're not that important um, I don't know, everyone I've kind of been in contact with that's a big birthday celebrator, they've got that kind of weird, you know, 
they kind of feel that like there's a weird entitlement about, oh, it's my special day. I can't believe you didn't come out to my day. Your day? Bloody, there's more, there's other things happening in the world apart from your bloody day, my dear, or my guy. You know what I mean? Like, take it easy, relax, rein it in, dude. But I don't know. That's just me, my personal opinion. I don't really necessarily begrudge those that do do it, but I think I'm just at a stage now where, you know, like you, you get you get to a certain stage in life where you just, you know, I, I, I'm not willing to change this part of my life, this, this part of my personality. I'm not willing to change it. I don't think I'm hurting anyone by not celebrating it. Um, I think if anything, I'm hurting myself, and if I am happy hurting myself, then I don't know. Say la vie in it. I'm 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 okay with it, and I don't necessarily bug anyone um, socially. I don't expect anything from anyone. I just keep my keep myself to myself. I do my own thing, and yeah, I think that's better for me. I think it was better, and it keeps it keeps me more sane. It allows me to just keep on carrying on. Today, I went out for a run. Um, I did a few tempo runs outside in the in the nice in a bit of heat out there because it's it's a fucking beautiful weather and i'm feeling good man i think that's the best way to go about it you know just just that's my way of celebrating my birthday had a good time i'm gonna have a, have a have a drink today and speak to you lovely people on the old podcast things so anyway enough about me 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 ironically right i hate birthdays but i'm speaking about me for the last 20 minutes let's crack on with some topics first of all um it's gonna be start off with some horrible or some sad news um, Avicii, the famous electro sweet or electronic um, Swedish DJ, is dead. He died at 28 years old, as you can see from the headline on Billboard. Um, it was reported the other day, I think, a couple of days ago. And yeah, it's just a sad state of affairs, especially when you read the whole story. Supposedly, he had his spleen and his pancreas removed because of excessive alcohol abuse. Ironic. Uh-huh. Um and drugs and stuff and it's just i don't know man i was never really you know i wasn't the biggest fan of his music i, I appreciate the, the fact that he came up so quickly and he was smashing at such a young age and the fact that he went from like you know being not an overnight success but you know he went from being someone that not a lot of people knew of so suddenly being someone that was shaping the sound that kind of like um what's that festival they have with the massive backdrop uh anyway you know those kind of festivals where everyone's like pilled up on mandy with like colorful feathers and shit he had that he had that particular scene on lock but for someone to die at 28 from like excessive partying is just what a sad way to go out man i think that's not the way to you know what i mean you wanna i think when i heard the news at first i thought okay maybe it's depression because he had disappeared from the limelight for a bit and yeah i remember him announcing that he was retiring because, you know, it was just too much and stuff. He kind of, after his whole Vegas residency was announced, that kind of got um, quickly scrapped and he announced he's retiring and he kind of like went off to Southeast Asia somewhere and no one kind of heard from him again. So I kind of thought, okay, maybe it was depression, you know? It's not a good thing, but you're like, okay, cool. Maybe he just couldn't handle it anymore. But then when you read this story and you hear that, you know, he died through complications of, you know, all that stuff that he was doing pre- previously, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit hard to swallow. And it's like, and it's even more sad, especially at that age. And maybe just looking at him, huh? maybe appearance can be deceiving, but you wouldn't expect someone that looks like this, right? That picture there of like to be the guy that's like, you know, dying of 28 because of excessive drugs and alcohol abuse. But um, I remember there was a bit I saw here. So yeah, it's, it says here in the article on Billboard, Avicii's health issues were known to the public for several years prior to his death. He suffered from acute pancreatitis in part due to his excessive drinking. In 2014, he cancelled numerous shows in order to receive, um, in order to recover after his uh, gallbladder and appendix was removed. Eventually, he decided to retire from touring entirely in an emotional letter penned in March 2016. Um, yeah, it's like he he writ and then he made a statement with the Hollywood Reporter in 2016 that that said, "To me, it's something I've had to do for my health." The scene was not for me. It was not the shows and not the music. It was this other stuff surrounding it that never came naturally to me. All the other parts of being an artist. I'm more of an introverted person in general. It's always very hard for me. I took on board too much negative energy, I think. The the bit that really strikes home with me in that statement is the fact that he, said he's, he's, he, he says he's introverted, right? Now, it's probably hard to kind of like give you... You know, I always say that I'm an introvert, extrovert, right? Extroverted introvert in terms of like... I like to be the center of attention, but I also like my own space right i i value my own space like when i go away like that time i went to berlin right I, um i stayed with a friend or the other time i went with airbnb but mostly i like to go in the stay in the airbnb when i go into berlin especially if i go and go party and shit i like to have my own space and sometimes if i go to if i go to a short european trip to go clubbing or whatever i even sometimes prefer getting my own apartment just because i want to have my own space for real like i want to be on my own like there's that weird kind of thing of like I want to be on my own between the hours of like nine to nine to 
10 p.m. And then from there, I want to be around people, right? But I also know that I enjoy going out and I enjoy getting fucked up, right? I actually enjoy that part of, like, um, uh, that idea that I'm disintegrating in public, right? I kind of like that. But for someone that's kind of um, uh, a self-confessed geek, right? Someone that's quite introverted who just was who just loved the music, right? He wasn't necessarily... Because it's weird because... I guess if you're a caner, yeah, like me, or if you're someone that likes to go out and likes to party and you get involved in that in that industry and you become an artist, an agent, a booker, you start working behind the scenes in the industry or you become a DJ or a singer, whatever it may be, it's, I, can, I can see, you can understand why, if you if you heard that I got fucked up and I had to go to rehab, you wouldn't be surprised, right? You'd be like, okay, I get it. Ag's always out and going for it anyway, right? But if you heard someone that's a quote-unquote geek and they go from being a geek and just loving the music, just loving the kind of... Um, the programming nature of like, you know, programming songs and co- deconstructing a song and making up and making a new one again, streaming on Twitch, sharing it with their friends. They like the the community around it. And they go from that to like having their gallbladder and appendix moved, uh, removed because they're drinking too much and doing too much drugs. It's like, whoa, that's the bit that really caught me off guard. It's like, how, um, how it just, it just shows that it must have been such the temptation must have been so crazy, he just could not refuse. It just must have been, like, obscene how hard it was to turn down. I just, I feel sorry that he didn't have anyone in his corner to kind of, like, you know, coach him out of that kind of dark, dark place. Or at least just allow, or at least just tell him, look, like, you can do this, but, like, let's have it in moderation. Do you know what I mean? Because I think that's the main part of these, these situations. You've got to do it in moderation. You can't be getting fucked up like this every single day. But I guess it's difficult when you're, when you're that young and you're you having fame for the first time and you're touring the world and everyone's at your and everyone's sucking your dick and you're like however old however old he is and stuff it must be super super difficult but anyway let one moment I I, I, I take my super potato fries out of the fridge And I'm back. It's funny that I said sweet potato out of the fridge. I meant out of the oven, right? So you're sweet potato fries out of the oven. I'm making sweet potato fries this week for my um, meal prep. I've got sweet potato fries with a bit of chicken breast that I um, covered in some homemade tomato sauce and cheddar cheese. I can't wait to get stuck into that. But yeah, RIP Avicii, man. Like, super sad that you're gone. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, especially in that kind of fashion. But I hope it does kind of... It, these things never, I don't know if they do teach people lessons, but I hope they wake people up a little bit more to like the issues around um, making it, especially at that age, especially in that kind of scene um, where drug use and all that stuff is kind of encouraged, you know, because you are touring the world, you're playing maybe four shows a day in various different time zones. There is, there, it's really different, especially in the beginning. From everyone I've seen online, I've re- interviews I've read, because obviously I like I like to follow DJs and just kind of like get an idea on what the industry is about and just I'm always reading interviews and watching clips online like that's the kind of thing I always do in my spare time and every and every every interview I've always seen of people especially like the biggest DJs out there have always come from the point of like they were overindulgent at the beginning and then they kind of weaned themselves off again right but they said in the beginning it was super important because there is no other way to stay up right to be energized to stay up and to kind of put your best foot forward and to keep with the best show you kind of maybe do need to partake a little bit in the recreational drug use and maybe excessive drinking, right? But then there comes a time where you either have to like pause for the sake of your career, health and family, or you need to just like give up in general because you just, you know, you're going to, you're you're self-sabotaging yourself. You're going to kill yourself in the end of it. And it seems like usually it's the people around you that kind of like, you know, always kind of check you and put and keep you, keep you in, keep you in check and kind of like pull the reins a little bit, let you go and kind of go crazy and then come, hey, hey, hey relax, 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 relax. But it kind of sounds like maybe Vichy didn't have those people around him. Everyone was maybe kind of, you know, it's, I think people around him need to also take a hard look at themselves as well in terms of like, you know, if they allow this to get this far, you know, everyone was kind of indulging the idea. And if you've got someone in your group that's a Vichy and he's able to get anything he wants and, it's so at a drop of a hat, it's very, very easy to kind of get um, easily. It's, it's it's easy to encourage that kind of behavior, especially if you believe some of the stories. I remember, I think I heard um, Brendan Shaw mention on the fire and the kid that um, I suppose we hear the story that during his um, Las Vegas residency, 
Avicii was supposedly sleeping, like nodding off on the decks because he'd, he'd done heroin like before the set started. I'm not sure whether he injected or he just took a pill, but he did something that was making him super drowsy. So he couldn't even play it. He couldn't even play a proper set during the time that he was in Las Vegas, which is kind of horrible to hear, really. You kind of hear a lot of it about, you know, I've kind of heard stories like that similar with other big um, house producers and shit who kind of, you know, hit stardom. But yeah, man, 28 is nowhere to go out. So RIP to Avicii and hopefully this is a lesson learned to everyone else that, you know, you you have to, everything has to be in moderation it's really difficult to say it especially when you're, you're in the beginning but i think you should allow yourself that that opportunity to kind of go a bit crazy you know especially if you're someone who never necessarily didn't go out and stuff but just be aware that you need to also it has to come to an end you have to kind of put the brakes on it eventually and it's better that you put the brakes on it yourself than your body put the brakes on it for you some an intervention happens or you lose something or something tragic happens that it kind of it forces you to put the brakes on it yourself and unfortunately it, it came too late for Avicii he couldn't he, his body couldn't recover from maybe the amount of abuse it suffered in that short space of time and yeah R.I.P. Avicii man gone but not forgotten what's the next topic here I want to speak about uh look on the list oh and this story man bloody hell what what a horrible story so r.i.p this guy right semi-finalist from um hopefully you guys can see it on the screen semi-finalist um and if you if, if on audio um so this guy master chef semi-finalist matt campbell d collapsed during london l l the london marathon and then died later in prison i think he, he collapsed with like three miles to go so maybe like i don't know mile 23 mile 22 or whatever um, he collapsed and he kind of later died in the hospital. And obviously, there's no postmortem that we don't know what the autopsy is going to say about what happened. Maybe he had some like underlying health issues already. He might have had some like um, hereditary heart problems in his family and whatever it may be. But wow, man, crazy. Supposedly, it was one of the hottest London heart, London marathons ever recorded. And judging by how hot that was on a day, because I wasn't, what was I doing on Sunday? I think I might, was I out? I think I might have been out on the Sunday, it was really, really hot. So I can only imagine what it must have felt like running that race, especially in the centre of London. Um, yeah, it must have been fucking sweltering um, in heat in there. So RIP to that guy, man, Matt Campbell, man. Like, what a crazy way to go out. Imagine collapsing during a, a marathon and then dying. Because I remember seeing similar sort of things happening at the Hackney Half Marathon, but it didn't really... I wasn't that nervous or afraid. Or I just thought, okay, people are getting heat stroke, you know? Because obviously, I think I mentioned it a few times, but the Hackney Half Marathon it's such a hot course because you go through most of like um, Hackney and Dalston and especially some of the new bits around the Olympic Park. There's no like big skyscrapers anywhere near it. No no block of flats or anything, no residential buildings, just stadiums and loads of like, um, what do you call it? Like flat open open ground kind of thing. I don't know how to describe it. So basically there's, what I'm trying to say is that there's no shade. So when, so when you're running there and it's really hot, the sun is literally beating down on you and there's no shade, absolutely no shade. So people were collapsing left, right, and center. Like, plus the one that people were collapsing on, collapsing at a lot. That was the one race where there wasn't that many water stations. I think they kind of fucked up with the organization, and there wasn't that many water stations. So people were just like dying, dying of dehydration, and also dying of like just kind of heat stroke and whatever. And I think a lot of people do like what I do because I know when I run, I tend to not do taking that many fluids prior to running. Because whenever I do, I always get a big stitch. So I'm assuming a lot of people might do the same. I'm not sure. I don't, really, I don't really see a lot of people drinking a lot of fluids before a race. But I know you're meant to hydrate. There's a window you're meant to hydrate in, right? You're meant to keep yourself hydrated between a certain sort of window. But if you're just an amateur runner and, you've know, and you know you've kind of had the same effect I have where you've kind of drank water before a race or something or before a run. Even, even during a morning run, I don't drink. I don't touch anything. I literally fast all the way through a run and then come back and have breakfast. I don't have anything in my stomach. I know I get a massive stitch. So maybe people have the same sort of way of thinking. So when you get to a race and it's really hot, you don't get li you don't take any liquids. Then you might miss a couple of water stations, and then they have water station, especially during a half marathon. They're not going to have a water station in every mile, are they? They're only going to have it at a specific key points. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Let's say two, four, six, and eight miles, and then one at maybe ten, right? Uh, before you kind of finish the last two miles. I don't know. Maybe let's say that kind of is the way they do it. Then uh, it's easy for people to get heat stroke, but. Bloody hell, man. This guy, Matt Campbell, as well, this MasterChef guy, looked fairly fit. Again, it goes to show, man, appearances can be deceiving. I'm I'm assuming it was um, some sort of hereditary thing, right? Like he probably suffered from some sort of heart condition. People in his family have, maybe. He got passed down something that hasn't never been uh, diagnosed and whatever, but Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, so RIP that guy. RIP that guy for real.
next topic it's starting off a bit heavy I'm, I, I, I do apologise um, it will get a bit fun now going forward because I'm going to talk about Kanye fucking West um, yeah man Kanye West, Kanye's come back on the scene in a big way isn't it like no music right um, no new shoes really he's shown some prototypes and samples but nothing nothing we haven't really um, maybe stuff, stuff we've seen no most stuff we've seen apart from the prototypes we've seen most of the stuff right it's nothing really outlandish we've seen some new colorways of the of the desert rats right that, those kind of like basketball type shoes the kind of lows that everyone's wearing um, in some really nice tonal I mean some nice pastel pinks and purples but the real news surrounding Kanye West is his awakening, right? Kanye West is awakening. He's kind of, um, his e entrance into the intellectual dark web as um, Dave Rubin likes to coin it. Um, it's an interesting introduction to the intellectual dark web for Kanye West because he's come at it straight from the whole idea of like, you know, he's he kind of already dabbled his feet into that pool when he stood next to Donald Trump at the Trump Tower that time. And now he's kind of affirm, affirmed that position by saying that he likes the way Candace Owens thinks, who's a, a kind of like a conservative or far right, not far right, let's say a, a conservative um, talking head, a black conservative talking head for, for for lack of a better word. The kind of person who says Black Lives Matter is, a, is like a waste of time and black people need to like pull themselves out by their bootstraps and stop being the victim and try, and that's how they're going to get forward in America. There is no institutional racism. That's That's kind of her point of view. But it's interesting to see Kanye come from that, Kanye come into it through that kind of lens, I guess, because he did, you know, we did hear him say in the beginning when he was kind of ranting and raving about the Najiti family and the lack of support he's getting for his fashion label, that he felt as if there was institutional racism that was holding him back, right, from being able to really produce his easy land at a high level. And we've kind of seen, even though he's, you know, he has kind of say some crazy shit, that he was, kind of, he was right, because the manufacturing level of the stuff he puts out now the 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 finesse the the high level of finish the quality of his stuff you can see that the stuff that he was ranting and raving about the kind of the infrastructure that he wanted the the financing the funding he wanted from like big companies to produce really high level stuff was warranted because his product is really good right everyone says the shoes are really good quality the clothing if you buy if you're into that sort of kind of look it's really good as well like everything is of very very high quality but it's also weird someone who who's had that point of view to now suddenly um, place himself next to like the middle class black experience. But it's also interesting from a perspective from someone that's not that's not an American, right? To see that there is it's it's a very different experience growing up um, being black in America, isn't it? It's very peculiar because there is it seems like Candace Owen isn't like not someone I necessarily prescribe with, it's not someone I kind of agree with on all the topics, but she you know she does just have some um good points what the things that she does say, but it's interesting to note that in America there are some black people out there who honestly think that there is no such thing as interest to racism, right? They think police brutality isn't a thing. They think the people that have been killed by police were justly killed and maybe they should have complied and all that sort of stuff. And Black Lives Matter is just a, a kind of um a domestic terrorist organization. There is that kind of point of view that exists yes we yes you only see the kind of rah rah kind of shouty shouty with the placards black lives matters people right but there is a fringe of people in america who who are vehemently against playing the quote-unquote victim card they don't necessarily get why some black people are just consistently um committing themselves to a life of crime um single parent households lack of money um drug abuse blah 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 this goes on and on and on which is really interesting to see because if you read this if you read Miles Davis' book, right, which is a very, very interesting book, Miles Davis was someone who always mentioned that he came from a very well-to-do family, right? His parents were, um, his, his dad had a massive ranch. His mom was, I think, an educator or something, or some a nurse. She said he had a good show. He, he came from a very middle-class family, but he was able to relate to the um, the black experience on on all various le on all the level on all levels of the economic scale, right? He was able to see it from the fact that he was. Um, he was um, often victimized by the police, right? Pulled over. There was a famous story he says in the book where he was told to move along by a police officer going to a verbal argument, which then turned into him getting arrested because they said that he was uh, resisting arrest. He ended up getting beaten up and shit. 
Um, he also sees it from the point of view of how he used to get taken advantage from record execs. But he also sees it from another point of view of like the idea that he was an intellectual, a black intellectual, right? Which didn't really exist at that time. Or not, was something that wasn't common in the people that he was hanging around with. But he's able to like relate to both experiences. But it's weird nowadays. People either operate on people. There, there, there is no middle ground, right? There's no like Candace Owens and um what's that guy called sean king combination right there is it, it, it doesn't exist right where there's someone who's able to see that there is there might be some systemic racism some institutional racism some kind of stuff that's holding people black especially in america back in that extent right the system is kind of rigged that way but it also has the same ha can also be honest enough to look yourself in the mirror and say as a community we have to do better right we have to kind of be more accountable to ourselves we have to police ourselves a lot more better we have to um create um wealth as a community in order to kind of have a voice in a political system whatever it may be right um we have to kind of be involved in a policy changes within our local community blah 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 blah. it doesn't really exist people operate on polar ends of the spectrum which is the only thing that really annoys me about this whole debate i don't mind what what kind of was saying if anything the only bit that's annoying is that he kind of he, ha he hasn't really explained his position he's kind of thrown out these little tidbits and stuff and it's kind of got people up all kind of uppity and like got their knickers all in a twist and a bunch and shit but i'd I'd, uh, I'd like if he kind of like fought out his um his his kind of decision making process a little bit more kind of explained how he got to that point of view that might be good and again, it won't convince people who don't want to be convinced anyway, but it just might just, it might explain his rationale behind it, be able to break it down, maybe be able to unpack it a little bit more might be a, a, of benefit. But I think in general, there's the underlying issue is that what is really concerning me is why people care so much, right? And the reason why I say that is that it's quite worrying the amount of reverence or importance people place on the opinion or of celebrities right and the, the fact that everyone's so worried that he's going to influence children to be far right extreme which was just you know fucking ridiculous but it's 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 very worrying how much faith people place in celebrities in general i think Kanye West should be allowed to say whatever balmy nutty stuff he wants to say right it's his prerogative like free freedom of speech do what you want but i think within your own household or within your circle of group or circle of friends you should be able to police or check each other often enough that you won't need to you won't be thrown of course when a celebrity says something that doesn't really align with your own moral compass um that's the most important thing it's like i think people need to concentrate a lot more on themselves man like focus more on yourself be more uh be more introspective i think take more time to kind of like formulate your own opinions it's very difficult to do because it requires you to kind of like sit with your own thoughts i think that's probably why people are getting so offended by what Kanye is saying because we look to celebrities as a point of escapism and to kind of inform or to kind of help us f uh, figure out what the world around us is, is, right? To kind of shape our environment in some kind of way because we don't want to be alone with our own thoughts, right? The same way how people are like shocked whenever I say I'm going on holiday by myself because, oh my God, how could you do that? It's so crazy because they can't bear the idea of sitting on their own with their own thoughts without having, having somebody else nattering away at them at some sort of inane conversation. They can't bear the thought of like having to, um, having to sit with that uncomfortable feeling that you're alone, right? And I think it's really important. It's very, very, very important. Now, it might not be meditation. It might not be all that sort of shit. It might not be traveling to far distant places on your own, but it's super important to kind of have that in mind, man. Like, if you're, if you're getting that outraged about some celebrity saying, you need to check yourself and kind of really, really figure out why it's affecting you that much figure out like why is it getting to you that much it must be something that you've kind of not figured out in life that's kind of throwing you off course and i think the moment you figure that out the moment that's the moment you've won in my personal opinion i think the moment that's the moment you've really really won in life and i hope i hope this this is a kind of water cooler moment where people kind of do sit back and think you know what what he's saying might be a bit crazy and he might only be talking to us now because you know he has something to sell a lot of people are making that kind of a, a point and saying that he you know, he only comes out and says these things when he's um he has kind of a, he's has a rollout of something right he was he was a push at us or a tour an album or whatever maybe and he has announced a, a fucking bunch of albums he's producing uh from tiana taylor nas to push the t um he's out an album a collabo album with kid cuddy that he's doing so there's a lot of stuff he wants to put out there plus of course probably new easy shit he announced he's probably going to open offices all around the world no not around the world L is it la 
somewhere else in America and London. So maybe there is something there, but I don't know, man. I think there there is a people need to focus on themselves, and I also think there needs to be a lot more. We need to be a lot more indifferent to what celebrities say. Like they do live in a bubble. Their their point of reality, their impression of reality is maybe a bit skewed. But also, they are people, right? So we need to be indifferent to people's points of view. We have to, you have to be indifferent. You have to live in a world where you you kind of have to understand that there are like there's people out there who have a different set of uh they have a different they have a different set of just opinions than you. Like they have a different way of looking at the world. It's just it is what it is. Like when when the hot water doesn't work in our house, for instance, right? And we have cold water. I see it as a point. I see it as an as an opportunity to train myself to kind of figure out how to have a shower, a cold shower all the time. Now I do have cold showers. Sometimes I have like a a cold shower at the end of a hot shower, right, for the last thirty seconds to kind of you know wake wake me up and shit. Especially if I don't want to drink coffee that day, it's an amazing way to kind of get yourself um, going. But that's the way I look at it when I have when my hot water isn't working. The brunette, when the hot water isn't working, she doesn't have a shower. She just like shouts, squashes her armpit. She refuses to jump in the shower when it's cold. Refuses. Like she just, she can't do it. So first of all, it hurts. I can't do it. It hurts me. It's, I'm going to be ill. I'm going to be sick. So where I see this opportunity to grow, to build, to make yourself better, she just sees it as a point of like, no, like I like having hot showers. If it's not hot, I'm not going to have one. Simple. It's like, and I think we need to be more aware that that's, that, that, that doesn't mean she's weak. It doesn't mean she doesn't, she hasn't, she has not strong or she hasn't got, um, good. Uh, she hasn't got willpower or everything. It's just her idea of a shower is it to be hot, and if it's not hot, she's not jumping in it. So some people just have different opinions, just different. They just have a different way of going about things, or they like to, you know, this conversation about, uh, I don't know, black empowerment or whatever, or whatever Kanye is speaking about now. These social issues or these kind of uh, this intersectional dark web conversation has been going on for a while. He might, he might only, he's only privy to it now. Someone's probably you know, put him onto a couple of videos. He kind of, he retweeted. No, uh, Scott Adams actually made a video about him. The the guy did Dilbert and who kind of um, predicted Donald Trump would win the election. And he kind of had this amazing battle, head-to-head uh, -head battle with uh, Sam Harris on his podcast, which you should definitely check out. Scott Adams v. Sam Harris. It was an amazing kind of debate. Because um, obviously Sam Harris is someone who kind of despises Donald Trump and everything he stands for. And Scott Adams kind of was someone who was able to kind of deconstruct why Donald Trump would be popular, especially nowadays, and why he kind of came out of left field and why none of the political analysts kind of correctly predicted his kind of rise to fame or kind of rise to prominence, whatever, and him eventually becoming the president of the United States. But he he might have been introduced to the party quite late. Kanye kind of might come into it quite late, but... I don't know, man. I'm just, I'm so indifferent about these things. I don't really care. Like, I don't care at all. I don't look to celebrities for my, um, for my uh, philosophical way of life or for my point of, I don't look to them for indicators of where I should be going in life in terms of a philosophy or of a moral compass. Not, not, not necessarily because I don't know them well enough and I don't know that's not what they signed up for they're entertainers they're celebrities you know i enjoy their art i enjoy their art they might say some stupid stuff like morrissey might come out with some crazy things like he says in the interview but you don't know how much of that is actually the real person or how much of that is that morrissey the artist you know consistently keeping themselves in the headline you know his music hasn't been as the music he's making now arguably isn't as good as the stuff he's put out in the past right but he's consistently relevant Right, because he always says these crazy things in interviews and contradicts himself and talks in riddles and speaks backwards and forwards and blah 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 blah. But it's interesting; it keeps you entertained, right? They might, but if you take those things really seriously and you think that's the way he really thinks, I think it, it's a bit. It, it probably shows you in a bad light more so than it does a, the person speaking, especially a celebrity, because they live in a weird world, man, where the currency that they have is attention. And we, we, we're kind of seeing it now with social media influencers, right? The currency, the real value in life or the real indicator of wealth isn't the Lamborghini, isn't the G-Wagon, isn't the mansion. It's how much attention can you garner? How many eyes can you put on yourself? And Kanye has all the eyes. I remember I was following him. When I started following him on Twitter again, he was on 4 million. Now he's on what? Close to 20 million followers on Twitter. 20 million. I'd love to know what the spike in interest was or the spike in just general usage on Twitter um, as a platform since his return. It must have spiked up crazy amounts. He's only made 141 tweets, mate, in that time. Most of them kind of quippy one-liners and some of them just pictures and shit. Like, that's, that's his 
lane. That's his kind of playground, you know? Controversy. He's he's consistently done this year after year after year after year after year, regardless of whether it's a mental breakdown, marrying a reality TV star, having children, naming them crazy names and shit. Just part of part of the game. So I don't necessarily take it that personally. And I'm and I'm indifferent again, because I've I think maybe because I read as much as I do and I try to have other sources of information um kind of uh dictate or direct the way i think about things in life i don't necessarily get that out of kill when i hear someone um in, in the public eye say something crazy about um current social issues or whatever because i'm already reading about something like I'm, I'm already reading a book about it that's analyzed something in the past that's got a little bit more weight to it uh, a bit more credence plus the book isn't you know a, you can read a lot more into a book than you can into a tweet of a 200 and whatever characters it is so i don't know man i think people need to concentrate more on themselves i kind of i would say leave kanye alone but i don't think he wants that i think he wants you to kind of listen to everything he has to say continue listening to it but don't get that don't get that don't get your nose out bent too much man it's just you know it is the life they live they're in hollywood they're in calabasas or oh, calabasas Ooh, calabasas why press that calabasas you know, you got to say crazy shit. You got to, you got to keep the attention on you and shit. I don't know what's happening. Uh, Ebro said something the other day about what could have happened. Charlamagne said something about the other. I don't, I don't know. It, it, it's all one big game, man. Every everyone's in a circus playing together. You know, Hotline Seven were dead in the water a couple of months ago, and now they've released all these conversations having with Kanye West is putting them back in the limelight. Charlamagne the God one day is someone that everyone hates. All of a sudden, he is Kanye's best mate. Everyone loves him again. It's just all one big game. I'm not really. I don't care, man. I, I, I watch the content, I um, I enjoy it for what it is, and I turn off and I, live, I, I go and live my life. I control the things I need to do. And I think you need to do that too, especially the pe people who are, who don't know what to do with their own life, right? When you corner them, you're like, oh, you should be you should be doing this, doing, I'm not corner them. Whenever they ask you a question about what you should be doing or they're not sure what they need to do in life and they have all these ideas and whatever it may be, you should spend more time executing your ideas, uh, shipping something, you know, like, shipping something in terms of like a, the the whole like um app development uh term you should put something out there deliver it pull it out there you know let people judge you um put your neck on the line for something like uh invest in yourself in that respect as opposed to spending all your time deconstructing the thoughts and opinions of someone you're never likely to meet or have a meaningful conversation with and who's someone whose job it is to garner attention in order to sell the things that they want to sell or in order to like market something they want to do like that's that's the, that's their currency attention and there's some people on this earth like there's you know like like, like great athletes or, or great musicians there's people who are experts masters at attention grabbing and he's one of them and i don't know man let's just let's just let him enjoy his time in the limelight if if if, if, if some good comes out of it say la vie if no good comes out of it then all good as well but i, I think people are getting really really emotional about it i don't know man i'm I look at you with a bit of a side eye, like, what's what's your deal, man? Like, you gotta, you gotta, I don't know, man. You remain, remain indifferent. Take a step back. Look at what you're not doing. There's many things that you need to address. You need to get your own house in order before you start pointing fingers as well. Like, just relax. Take it easy. Take it easy. Take a deep breath and exhale. You know what I mean? Relax, relax, relax. So, yeah, I say relax on Kanye. Let him do his thing. Who really cares? Next topic. Oh, I talk about liberties already. Um, what do I want to talk about here? Hmm. Oh, this is a good article, actually. Maybe to end it off on this. I, I read this article about um, if having a day job is the... What does it say? I read some notes on it, actually, in the bottom. What did I say here? Um, I didn't actually write any notes. Damn it. Okay. But anyway, the, the, the crux of the, of the article, as you can see from the image... Um, it's saying does having a day job mean making better art right so it kind of breaks it's an amazing article I'll, I'll link it into the top into the um, notes at the bottom of the video or at the bottom of uh, in the description of the podcast if you listen to it and above the video so you can check out yourself a uh, great New York Times article and basically it kind of uh, analyzes those people in history who kind of were able to balance their occupation with also their kind of like side hobbies on the side. It kind of points out this Albanian president or prime minister who's also an artist, a renowned artist who's able to balance both things. It pronounces other people who are able to like maybe have a day job and then do their kind of um, creative endeavors from six to one. The kind of, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk method of like, you know, it's not what you're doing. It's not what, it's not how many hours you sleep. It's what you're doing when you're awake. So it's the idea of like, okay, if you've got a full-time job, please use the time that you have outside of the full-time job to do the things you need to do. And whilst I say that, let me pause one minute and get my uh, sweet potato fries out of the oven. Not the fridge this time. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, and I'm back. There we go. It looks nice and crispy and tasty. Might show you them later, or maybe not. Um, anyway, yeah, um, it's a great article. Really, really good article. Because it does speak a lot of... It does um, point out a lot of things that I've kind of um, felt were very important. It, especially the idea that... Um, it's it's very important that especially if you're doing something especially if you're if you're not looking to make a career in a job that you're doing right now right you're not looking to stay there for the rest of your life and you want you have other aspirations and dreams and things that you want to do it's very important to pick a job that is able to either feed your curiosity or doesn't take that much out of your create it doesn't take much energy out of you so then when you finish work you can start doing your creative shit outside of work that's the most important thing i've learned because I think other jobs I've had where on paper they're amazing jobs, right? Great title, amazing salary, great benefits and shit. It takes out so much out of you that there's nothing, you have nothing left. You have no, no creative energy, no creative ideas left in order to kind of do your thing outside of work. Now, that might just be me not pushing myself more. I might need more discipline. I might need to push myself harder. I might need to commit more time to my projects and shit. That could be true. But I think I've been able to consistently do the stuff that I'm doing now in terms of the podcast, in terms of DJing, in terms of uh, writing on my blog, in terms of sometimes taking pictures and shit. I'm able to do that more often now because I'm doing a job that doesn't require, that doesn't tax my mind as much as it sh as much as other jobs had, have done, right? But there is also another aspect of it, which, mean, which, uh, which I'm also sometimes a lot more annoyed at, especially with people that are creative, where it's like, even if the job isn't that taxing to your mind, you still have to do it to a good level to like you have to do it well so that you can carry that same momentum into your creative work because it goes it's that adage that people a lot of people say where or it's a saying that goes something along the lines of how you do some how you do one thing is how you do everything right how you do some things how you do everything so the idea behind it is that if you're gonna half half shit at work even if it's easy then you're gonna half half shit outside of outside you can't necessarily just turn it on and turn it off it doesn't it doesn't happen you have these stories of people who kind of like say oh i couldn't do that so i just walked out and did my own thing I don't necessarily think that's a good way of going about things. It doesn't necessarily build a good um, work ethic, in my opinion, personally. I think you should treat... If you're, I remember when I used to sweep floors in shops and shit and be a sales and I wasn't any sort of manager, I used to take pride in it. I used to take pride in being able to relay shoes and being able to like keep standards on the shelf and um, educate myself about products and go out my way to make sure customers feel welcomed and comfortable and shit. Because I felt that if I were able to do that well... It would, it would inevitably lead on to me doing other things outside of my um, my kind of occupational life world too. And again, it's a balance because in life, obviously, you don't get that. Sometimes you don't get the benefit of having to, of being able to work a job that is um, not that taxing, doesn't take that much out of you, um, energy, uh, not, not that mentally taxing, doesn't, doesn't take that much out of you physically, um, pays okay, doesn't you have to travel too far, has a good kind of like work-life balance in terms of, you know, the people you work with that you actually like hanging out with and you don't take that much time out of your day, blah, 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 and you actually enjoy it. It's very difficult to get those things right. But I think the most important thing to get right is the idea of like, if you're going to work somewhere and you're going to do creative stuff outside of it, you have to kind of make sure that it's either something that is going to feed your curiosity or your creativity or isn't going to take that much out of your creativity so you can apply it once you leave. And it, that, this article does a really good job of kind of analysing that. Because I think that's a bit that people don't really speak about too much. Because I think the idea of having a job and doing art on the side is kind of um, self-explanatory, right? If you live in a metropolitan city and your parents aren't rich and you don't have any inheritance and you don't have a trust fund, then you're going to have to get a job anyway in order to keep pay rent. It's just standard, right? Unless you get lucky and someone decides to uh, be your kind of saint patron, your patron or some shit, right? And give you money every month or whatever so you can just exist. But for the most part, um, life will dictate that you have to get a job cool and you see usually people do this thing where they kind of always work part-time jobs so you never really be able to commit to something and plus it's flexible so if you're a bartender you can do you can do um castings and all that sort of stuff during the day and you can maybe write and shit and then kind of work during the night and then do the same thing again the next day so i think that kind of works but i think in general there is that's the kind of thing that's not really spoken about a lot but i think the idea of like being very disciplined in your occupation will definitely definitely help in terms of your creative endeavor i think it's very 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 important something that a lot of people don't really speak about a lot and i think people do kind of take being employed for granted you know the idea someone's paying you every month um consistently um the idea that you have the opportunity if you do if you if you do want to kind of progress in the company you have the opportunity to grow you have people that you work with that kind of want to help to kind of see you succeed and shit i think people take but take that for granted too because there's people out there that don't have anything right for the most part and that's not, not to get on my kind of like preachy high horse but 
it's it's very difficult to get a good job, like especially some, well, something that pays well, especially in a, a busy metropolitan city. So if you do have one, don't take it for granted, but also make sure that you're using it. You're using the, the resources that they're giving you, the opportunity, the time, the money, the security to do actual work, right? To actually work on your shit for real. Don't waste time. Don't waste your time worrying about what kind of is tweeting and shit or whatever people are speaking about in the political in the political landscape it may be especially doesn't affect your life personally concentrate on you concentrate on you your friends your family and everything else work itself out that's the most important thing but this article is really 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 good i really recommend you check it out um it's by a writer called katie waldman katie waldman in the new york time t magazine but i'll link it in the show notes below i think that's a really really check excellent book you check out and of course this book too that I've been reading a lot lately. Um, I've just about finished it. I bought it a while ago, but I didn't finish the whole entire book. Meet me in a bathroom. Um, amazing book that kind of details the rise and kind of fall of the indie scene during New York in New York City during 2001, 2011. If you're a fan of Interpol, if you're a fan of The Strokes, if you're a fan of those kind of bands, um, LCD Sound System. They definitely recommend you check it out. So many good stories in here, man. So many, so many things that I kind of identify with, especially during the time that I was kind of coming up doing the whole party scene shit. There's some really, really good stories here that I would like to, to maybe read another time because I haven't really noted them down yet today. But I'll probably check them another time. But yeah, anyway, um, that might be a good way to end it. Maybe should I maybe do something on here? Nah, let me end it there. I think that might be a good place to end it. Again. This episode number 69 of the Agustino Zinger Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Like, it's been an absolute pleasure and an absolute joy to have you uh, in my presence again to witness the birth, the rebirth of the Agostino. The rebirth, rebirth. We're a couple of beers in, or one beer in, actually. We're going to hopefully get some more in later in the evening. And yeah, thank you for tuning in to the Agostino Zinger Show. Uh, it's been lovely speaking to you. I can't wait to see you guys again. Hopefully do another podcast at the end of the week to kind of round things off before the weekend. That might be a good idea for me to do. As ever, please check out my link at the bottom for Audible. If you are wanting to get onto the whole reading book train, then you should definitely check out Audible. They have the best audio books out there. They have more than like 400,000 titles. Some of the books are read by the authors themselves, so the books come alive in your ears, alive in your ears. You can stream it, you can download it. It's available on iOS and Android. So check out my link below to get 30 a 30 day free trial as plus one as well as one one free book credit for you to test out and you can cancel any bloody time any bloody time this is actually a show episode number 69 thank you for tuning in it's been a pleasure i'll see you on the other side Boo!